So should we be worried by the rise of the machines? Tim Muffet reports. There's at least 500 years of, of people reinventing ourselves as machines and building robots. Some here are so old they can no longer be moved. These are robots, they're medieval robots. They had these sort of tremendous religious connotations, people fascinated by these machines that prayed. But only in the 20th century did robots as we think of them today appear. Big companies always tend to build a robot, a humanoid robot, to show off their technological capabilities. They're always associated with the very state of the art of technology. I'm a sophisticated combination of hardware and software designed to interact with humans. I thought that was the best paper airplane I saw made from a robot. We often think of robots as having a human-like appearance, but that specifically is what an android is. Robots are not defined by their shape. If we want robots to move out of factories into homes and schools and all those sorts of places, what's the best way for that to happen? In the UK, if you have a robot which is ultra lifelike with human hair and eyebrows and that sort of thing, people tend to go, ooh, crikey, don't know if we like that. Whatever their appearance, the impact of robots on the workplace has been profound. We are doing things fundamentally differently to how they've been done in the past. Associate Professor of Machine Learning Michael Osborne has been assessing it. So we found that 35% of current UK employment is at high risk of being replaced by a robot or similar technology by the year 2030. Those in the transportation industry, so that would include truck drivers, uh, taxi drivers, um, processing of things like invoices and receipts. Um, robots are also being used for things as advanced as surgery these days. The pace of change has been dizzying. But some robots do things people won't or can't do. The snake arm robots made by this Bristol company can inspect and maintain restricted, hazardous places. Nuclear reactors, for example, or aircraft wings like this. Uh, it's following a path that's curved, that's very much smaller than a human arm in cross-section. Um, and uh, it goes around bends that you simply couldn't get your elbow around. Robots are going to be doing more and more tasks. We shouldn't fear them. We should embrace them, make use of them. For better or for worse, the rise of the robots seems unstoppable. Okay, let's find out how the weather is looking. Ben Rich has the details for us. Hi, Ben. Hi there, Joanna. Thank you. The weather is throwing just about everything at us today. We've had a bit of snow across parts of Scotland. Many of us started off with rain this morning, but there is some sunshine as well, as captured by our weather watcher in Liverpool. Look at this glorious picture uh, looking across the Mersey into the city. Sunny skies here to start the day, but in western areas where we have the sunshine, we also have some pretty hefty showers, some of these with hail and thunder down towards the southwest. All the while across eastern areas, we hold on to a lot of cloud and some damp weather. And for Scotland, there will be further snow, especially up over high ground, but even some wintriness to low levels, which could cause some travel problems. Then this evening and tonight, our band of cloud and patchy rain in the east will start to move westwards again. Still some flakes of snow over high ground. Out west, some clear spells, a chilly night, and perhaps some icy stretches in one or two places. This is called the Atlas robot. It's about the same height as me and the same weight.
This robot, as far as I can tell, has the best rough terrain mobility of anything that's ever been built. Every stairway is different. None of them are to code. Here we're testing out the idea of whether or not you could do home deliveries. <laughs> anything that you or I could do, we'd like the robots to do.
welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. White collar robots are taking yuppie jobs too. We've got that story plus rules for moon travel, but first we go to Florida. Media Monarchy and Corbett Report have reported on Orlando all week and will include links to those reports. But for now, we'll leave that story where it is and cover some different stories on this New World Next Week. Florida attorney says growing vegetables not a fundamental right. A local controversy is brewing in South Florida surrounding yet another instance of local governments imposing fines on residents and persecuting them over having gardens on their property. After living in Miami Shores for 17 years and growing veggies in their front yard for the same amount of time, Tom Carroll and Hermine Ricketts were forced to dig up their garden in front of their home in 2014. That was a few months after the Miami Shores Village Council passed a new zoning plan, meaning that low-level bureaucrats wasted no time in fanning out among the residential areas to uproot the violators. The couple is now suing on grounds that the ban on front yard gardens violates the Florida Constitution by imposing improper limits on private property rights as well as violating the Equal Protection Clause. The couple's being represented by lawyers with Institute for Justice, a libertarian nonprofit. I've got an archive on MediaMonarchy.com going back seven, eight years using the tag of urban food. And it's a discussion where every other article is either community going after people having gardens or another community overturn the law to say that they can grow gardens. And there again are articles going back years and years and years noting that the urban food revolution has exploded. And fortunately, like a lot of things that are helping us and not helping the powers that shouldn't be, it's kind of another case of once the toothpaste is out of the tube, there's no way to stop it. And as more the phony baloney economy collapses, more people are just going to do it. And this, in a lot of ways, is that sort of nullification. Yes, yes. Nullification for the people. And this is something I've been thinking about recently. The difference between the mindset of people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, where you read about strikes and direct action and people being non-compliant with laws that are clearly atrociously ridiculous. And today, where the closest we can get to that is some kind of Occupy movement that's going to par- uh, camp in a park and wait there until something? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, what what are they doing? No, this is the type of direct action that people should be involved in. If your local city council or whatever is trying to pass some ridiculous, bogus law that you can't grow vegetables in your front yard, or you can't collect rainwater on your own property, or you can't go and feed the homeless, or other ridiculous laws like this, Every single person in that area should be breaking those laws. They do not apply. They do not have force if you do not allow them to enforce those laws. And these are the types of things that no one can disagree with. No one can get angry about, oh my god, he's growing tomatoes in his front yard. It's so ridiculous. And every time people just lay down and submit to stupid laws like this, they are enslaving themselves. And every time they stand up and resist something even as simple as this, they are flexing that muscle and getting a little bit stronger each time and getting it into their heads that they do not have to comply with laws that are self evidently ridiculous so my if anyone in that area is listening to this please start (laughs) growing vegetables we usually mention it towards the end of these episodes the good news next week spinoff that i started doing earlier this year the latest episode of good news next week is gardening more powerful than presidents it's that story on activist post about it gets at the kind of idea the fundamental truth of Growing a garden is going to give you more satisfaction this fall than holding your nose and voting for, again, some phony baloney powers that shouldn't be. Shall we move to story number two? Let's do it. And here come the robots. Meet Betty the robot, the perfect office manager. A transportation company in the town of Milton Keynes in the UK has recruited a new trainee office manager in the form of a robot called Betty. Bug-eyed looking Betty will carry out tasks including patrolling the offices, collating data on clutter and noise, and checking fire doors and checking fire doors are closed and desks are clear. She'll be tasked with greeting guests at reception when visitors come to see the catapult's famous driverless pod cars. 
Betty is a highly sophisticated robot running artificial intelligence-driven software developed by an international research team led by, there's so many buzzwords in that paragraph, <laughs> led by the University of Birmingham. Betty is part of the 7.2 million pound EU-funded STRANDS project, that's S-T-R-A-N-D-S, where robots are learning how to act intelligently and independently in real-world environments while understanding 3D space and how this changes over time from milliseconds to months. There's been lots of talk about how robots are going to take the low-end, greasy jobs at Fast Food Nation. But we talked about when the Davos conference was going on earlier this year in January, they kind of chucked the idea of the Davos man and just rolled out the idea of Davos robots. So it might not just be the, the kids at Wendy's. <laughs> yeah, no, it might not. So say it with me, James, and I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. Uh, yeah, you're right. There has been a lot of talk about this idea, this year specifically, but obviously in recent years, but really it's ratcheting up right now. And how many different stories like this can we name just from the past several months? There's the Davos uh, story. It was on the Davos agenda, the replacement of human workers. And uh, it was uh, it's in Wendy's or McDonald's or wherever else. They're all starting to do automated um, ordering. It's uh, stories like this one. Um, we can throw in the Adidas uh, moving uh, factories back to Germany story. Oh, with the catch, oh, it's going to be robot workers in the factories. So um, whatever, whether this is a coordinated news agenda to promote this as the next big idea or just a reflection of the coming reality in the economy, it is coming. Robotization, automation of almost every aspect of the productive manual industrial economy is coming. And this is a story that really is an inflection point for humanity. Historians of the future will be writing the story of this era either as the time when we freed ourselves from the chains of manual physical drudgery and freed human productivity to start, you know, doing all the things that people actually want to do instead of going to a slave job for eight hours a day, five days a week and doing life-depriving, boring stuff, or it will be the story of, oh, and then the depopulation started. So I don't know if there is a happy ending for this, given this, the power structure that exists today, given the top-down oligarchical control that already exists over this system. They clearly don't need the mass of humanity anymore, and as Brzezinski loved to go around saying just a few years ago, it's easier now to kill a million people than to control a million people. Uh, if that doesn't send shivers down your spine, you're not paying attention. So this is, I mean, this is for all the marbles. This is either where we start taking it into our own hands to start getting out of that system and start interacting with each other so that we become useful and productive to each other, or we just turn to government and say, hey guys, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to save us from this? What kind of food stamp program can you put these displaced workers on? And I think we know how that story is going to end. Well, <laughs> I reported for you this morning on the Morning Monarchy how that story is going, and it doesn't go well when the food stamp electronic benefits don't go through. And that, I think, leads into what we've talked about before, James. It's the Soylent Green scenario. It really, truly is if, if this is that point where it, it goes off in one direction or the other. And we see the little goofy stories that we can kind of laugh at. We'll include in the show notes. And again, everything we mention will always be included in the show notes. Robot escapes testing grounds, disturbs traffic in Russia. Now, this could conjure up all kinds of chaos, but it's a big, goofy-looking round robot that rolled out into the street. And there was never any real danger. And you can look at it and kind of laugh and say, ah, you got to just gotta go back to the drawing board. But those are going to pile up, and they'll pile up. And if you think over the seven years, and especially back towards the beginning of New World Next Week, watch for these drones. They're pretty much going to take over, and they're going to be everywhere. And we saw little funny stories where they would crash, and then it becomes just de rigueur or fait accompli. So you're not allowed to garden, and robots took all our jobs. So let's go to the moon. U.S. draws up rules for commercial moon travel. U.S. government agencies are working on temporary rules to allow a private company to land a spacecraft on the moon next year, 2017, while Congress weighs a more permanent legal framework to govern future commercial missions to the moon, Mars, and other destinations beyond Earth's orbit, officials said. Plans by private companies to land spacecraft on the moon or launch them out of Earth's orbit 
face legal obstacles because the U.S. hasn't put in place regulations to govern space activities. The vaunted 1967 Outer Space Treaty obliges the U.S. and other signatories to authorize and supervise space activities by its non-government entities. But no U.S. agency has authority to regulate commercial space activities outside of rocket launches, spacecraft re-entries into the atmosphere, and operations of telecommunications and remote sensing satellites in Earth orbit, the communication stuff. The issue's coming to a head in part because of a request by Florida-based Moon Express for mission from for permission rather from the U.S. government to land a spacecraft on the moon in 2017. So far, only government agencies have flown satellites beyond Earth's orbit. Other countries are moving faster to establish rules for space launches than the U.S. in compliance with international treaties. Luxembourg last week announced it's partnering with two U.S. companies interested in mining asteroids and set aside $226 million to woo space firms to relocate. The United Arab Emirates also intends to serve as a commercial space haven. So the article does actually note that this would probably be another probability where Americans lose jobs to other countries. We talked about the Space Mining Act back in November of 2015 on this very show. Congress passes Space Mining Act with no growth limits. And again, we see these stories are going to grow and grow and grow. We're going to land something on the moon for space tourism in one year, James. You know, well, I don't know about space tourism quite yet, but certainly for uh, whatever purposes these private companies. They won't say. Yeah, they exactly. They won't say what this mission is. But anyway, I mean, I, I mean, the implications, the ramifications of the choices that are being made here, just, just think about what this ultimately entails. If we start ceding the power to governments to decide who can or cannot go into space for what purposes... That is the power for to control the future of the human species, really. Um, and it's so incredibly important right now. I mean, uh, as, as important as growing vegetables in your front yard is, how many bajillions times more important is it for people who can, who can possibly put together their own private space travel, whatever, to be doing that in full defiance of any treaties or obligations or, or laws that any government presumes to pass on that. It truly is the future of the human species that hangs in the balance here, because if we cede that control to the governments, then the oligarchs now control outer space. And I, I, I think everyone can concede the need for some sort of coordination on in things in, in terms of satellite orbits, I mean, having junk orbiting in space can literally take down satellites and, and things of that nature. So there does need to be some sort of coordination, but to simply cede the power to government to say, you can go to the moon for this, or you can't go to the moon for that. I mean, it's just, we have to stop them from taking that power. And again, the only way to actually stop them from doing it is to do it. So I would hope that there's some non-controlled corporation, uh, unlike Moon Express, that will actually go and do this without seeking approval. That's the situation. So whether it's a garden, just do it. Just maybe in Ohio, they just recently legalized medical marijuana. Just start, grow just start growing it marijuana. It all comes back to Nike for you Oregonians, doesn't it? It does. That's the battle right there. So there's actually new software and a website that shows satellites and space junk circling the Earth in real time. It almost looks like one of those website plugins where it shows you all the visitors that are coming to your website and where other locations are from. There is a lot of satellites and a lot of space junk circling around out there. So again, we'll include the show notes to the flashbacks from the Space Mining Act, but we'll also mention, again, a little bit of good news. Gardens More Powerful Than Presidents is my latest episode of Good News Next Week, plus beating Nestle, which not only we did, again, in Oregon, but they just did it in Pennsylvania as well. And the UK is turning off a lot of CCTV because guess what? They totally don't work at stopping crime. <laughs> Meanwhile, the FBI says U.S. homicide rate at a 51-year low. Murder rate down 49% over a 20-year period. So that's another way that sort of shows you mainstream media wants to sell you chaos, murder, and mayhem and to fall for that and to make all your decisions out of fear. Hopefully you're here watching this because you're done doing that.
Some of the other stories we're watching using hashtag New World next week. Senate votes for equal slavery for women. One of the last things we discussed on the previous episode of New World next week, where men, even though there's not a draft, have to sign up for the selective service in case they want to have a draft. Now women get that same opportunity. And of course, Hillary is down for it. A couple of questions to leave at the wrap of this episode. Will Israel use another Euro football tournament as a cover for war? And will Brexit happen and a collapse of the EU? And will people just ultimately lose their minds when the summer solstice happens? James, <laughs> we're going to be a bulwark against that in independent, non-commercial alternative media. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not planning to take any much, if any, summer vacation. So I'll be here to document all of that. I've got, a, I've got a little bit coming up. We'll have to discuss that. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, until then, I'm looking forward to talking to you again next week. Thanks for these stories. All right, man. Thank you. To be lost. But we really have to think hard, not in terms of employment, although we have to think about that too, of course, but we need to think hard about the kinds of controls that we want to cede to machines. Do we want machines make, making medical decisions about us? I don't think so. I mean, in terms of then moving forward, how do you think people now should consider the type of roles they take on, making sure that they're choosing a job that's going to be for life? I mean, is there even such a thing moving forward that there will be a job for life? Well, I think we can forget about the job for life. I think we can almost forget about that now. But, but I would recommend to young people, and it's not good for everybody, but I would recommend to young people that they work in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we're trying to get that changed to STEAM subjects so that there's an arts component in there. Because there's no doubt in my mind that if you're good at science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics, and you're creative, then you're going to succeed. You've got to be really flexible in your education now. We have to change our education system so that there's considerable more flexibility of skills because that's what will win the day. And, and if you're not creative, you know, you've really got to be in the innovative front and then you're going to be protected for forever. But also, if you have a job in law, in the low level law jobs will go, certainly, because you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to do all kinds of minor accounting cases. Accountancy is not a safe place either. And even journalism, there are already AI programs that are collecting newspaper reports and then a sub-editor whizzes through them and, and does a bit of editing. So even that's not safe. And I'm told that these are only low-level jobs, so good journalists will still be okay. But how are journalists going to be trained if they don't start with the low-level jobs? You will know about this. Well, it's um, nice for you to tell me that my job could be at risk <laughs> from this. Um, Professor Noel Sharkey, thanks so much. Good talking to you. How could you ever, how could you ever doubt it? <laughs> uh, more now on the announcement that patients from abroad are to be charged for non-urgent treatment on the NHS. The median wage is now dropping, adjusted for inflation. Uh, and most people looking at it, most economists looking at it, find that it's no longer globalization. Uh, that's causing the median wage to drop. It's actually technological change. Sure. Uh, now, if we are really on the cusp of the kind of disruptive technologies you're talking about, we could presumably see a lot of people not only out of work, but the median wage continue to drop. Absolutely. So the question is, who's going to buy the stuff? So um, it's a fascinating question. Let me, let me answer it in two parts. One, a, a friend of mine, uh, an SU alumnus, just wrote a book which I love. I love the title in particular, but the content's awesome too. It says, "Robots will." The, the title is, Robots Will Steal Your Jobs, But That's Okay. Um, and the notion is uh, that we are moving into a world where uh, there's going to be a disconnect between work uh, and living, and I think society is going to have to find some new balance points. You know, I've talked about creating job X prize and so forth, but ultimately when AI and robots are really operating at the cost of electricity, which by the way, given solar and renewables and so forth, ultimately comes down very low as well, we live ultimately, whether you want to fantasize with me or not, in a Star Trek universe where, um, where I have the ability for what my basic needs are being met. So in abundance, I talk about the abundance pyramid on the basis food, water, shelter, you know, uh, 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 education, energy, communications, uh, health care, and freedom. And so if, in fact, the cost of these things is beginning to drop, if this phone becomes my physician, if this uh, AI on this phone 
becomes my educator. And my education for a Maasai warrior in Africa on a tablet, which by the way, they got the tablet for free because some company wants to be able to sell them something. So you give the tablet away ultimately. Um, that becomes my educator, my healthcare uh, capability. People's basic needs begin to drop. Um, you know, the example I give is if you look at people below the poverty line in the United States today, 99% of the people under the poverty line today have a refrigerator, a flushing toilet, running water, a roof over their heads, like 88% have air conditioning, 78% have a car. Basically, these are the most impoverished in America that have resources and capabilities that the wealthiest 150 years ago never could dream of. We're moving the poverty line. And so we're going to be fundamentally changing society. And the question is, um, maybe people don't have jobs. You know, I, I, I were joking where I say I'm sort of a libertarian capitalist at heart, but we're heading towards a future of socialism. Hi, my name is Fede and this is Robots Will Steal Your Job. Welcome to this new course on jobs, automation, the workforce, basic income, human rights, the economy and much more. We will see how all of this plays a huge role into a transformation that is going to affect all of us. I have selected many videos that will explore this topic. And the first one is a TEDx Vienna talk that I gave in 2012, which really opened up a discussion at the public debate and for me was a game changer because since then I have been working tirelessly on this topic, exploring every single detail and I've been lecturing around the world for this reason. But now for you, dear student who has chosen to go beyond the general discussion and wants to get their hands a little dirty and dig deep into this topic, this is the place for you. We'll start as an introduction with a talk I gave at Vienna and we will explore a lot more as we move along. Hope you enjoy, I see you in the next video. But that specifically is what an android is. Robots are not defined by their shape. If we want robots to move out of factories into homes and schools and all those sorts of places, what's the best way for that to happen? In the UK, if you have a robot which is ultra lifelike with human hair and eyebrows and all that sort of thing, people tend to go, oh, quirky, don't know if we like that. Whatever their appearance, the impact of robots on the workplace has been profound. We are doing things fundamentally differently to how they've been done in the past. Associate so Professor of Machine stand. Learning Michael Osborne has been assessing it. So we found that 35% of current UK employment is at high risk of being replaced by a robot or similar technology by the year 2030. Those in the transportation industry, so that would include truck drivers, uh, taxi drivers, um, processing of things like invoices and receipts. Um, robots are also being used for things as advanced as surgery these days. The pace of change has been dizzying. But some robots do things people won't. So have some pretty hefty showers, some of these with hail and thunder down towards the southwest. All the while across eastern areas we hold on to a lot of cloud and some damp weather. And for Scotland there will be further snow, especially up over high ground, but even some wintriness to low levels, which could cause some travel problems. Then this evening and tonight our band of cloud and patchy rain in the east will start to move westwards again. Still some flakes of snow over high ground. Out west some clear spells, a chilly night and perhaps some icy stretches in one or two places. This is called the Atlas robot. It's about the same height as me and the same weight. Should we be worried by the rise of the machines? Tim Muffet reports. There's at least 500 years of, of people reinventing ourselves as machines, building robots. Some here are so old, they can no longer be moved. These are robots, they're medieval robots. They had these sort of tremendous religious connotations. People were fascinated by these machines that prayed. But only in the 20th century did robots, as we think of them today, appear. Big companies 
always tend to build a robot, a humanoid robot, to show off their technological capabilities. They're always associated with the very state of the art of technology. I'm a sophisticated combination of hardware and software designed to interact with humans. I thought that was the best paper airplane I saw made from a robot. We often think of robots as having a human-like appearance. This robot, as far as I can tell, has the best rough terrain. Or can't do. The snake arm robots made by this Bristol company can inspect and maintain restricted, hazardous places. Nuclear reactors, for example, or aircraft wings like this. Uh, it's following a path that's curved, that's very much smaller than a human arm in cross-section. Um, and uh, it goes around bends that you simply couldn't get your elbow around. Robots are going to be doing more and more tasks. We shouldn't fear them. We should embrace them, make use of them. For better or for worse, the rise of the robots seems unstoppable. OK, let's find out how the weather is looking. Ben Rich has the details for us. Hi, Ben. Hi there, Joanna. Thank you. The weather is throwing just about everything at us today. We've had a bit of snow across parts of Scotland. Many of us started off with rain this morning, but there is some sunshine as well. That's captured by our weather watcher in Liverpool. Look at this glorious picture uh, looking across the Mersey into the city. Sunny skies here to start the day, but in western areas where we have the sunshine, we also...